we we're live. live. We're live. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, 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 uh, everyone. Uh, sorry about that. We were just having an offline conversation, and that's true. These things are live. Um, this was a lot of fun putting together over uh, the last couple of weeks, Benjamin. Yes. Uh, I think everybody's going to be really excited because uh, we're going to do some interesting things today. We're going to automate some other things that are uh, mundane and uh, not as uh fun to do uh, and some of the more exciting things that we can uh, go and expand the scope and pull on a few threads and find some threads out there that we may not have known uh, existed prior to. And so um, we'll wait for some, I don't know, a minute or so yeah. piling into the room here um, and we'll get started. But anything standing out to you recently as people get in the, the room here? Um, the the necess necess necessity of multi-factor authentication that <laughs> saved my butt. You think? So we'll get into that today. Yes. No. So my personal account uh, was saved from multi-factor authentication. And um, we'll examine the attack. And I was surprised um, at um, how sophisticated it was. So who knows where it came from, but it was sophisticated it was sophisticated uh, i remember looking through some of the artifacts um when you were showing me after it had happened not to not to uh, make light of it or anything but it does go to your point where two-factor or multi-factor mfa 2fa you know all, all's all cool here um but that uh, uh it really worked in this particular case you actually got to experience that thing that uh, the marketing people are always talking about when they're selling right. up those uh, duo and identity solutions and stuff. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, here, why don't we, uh, you're sharing your screen, right? So you want yeah. to, okay. So I let, let's go ahead and get into it, folks. Uh, we have a lot of interesting labs today. So we're going to just speed through some of this intro stuff for those of you that are new, um, just to make some introductions. And then we're going to get right into the labs today, which are pretty intense, uh, but also very scalable. So when you implement them at home or at work, which is kind of the both the same thing lately. Um, when you implement it, you'll be able to uh, to actually see it uh, directly and, and scale a lot of your efforts. You know, do it once, scale it to a thousand, kind of thing. Um, but go ahead, Benjamin. So I'm I'm Benjamin Powell, I'm the senior product marketing manager here at Microsoft. I've worked in IT for over 35 years, focused primarily in security for the last 15. I've worked in all different industries, um, state government. Um, in San Diego, we had the International Airport in the Port District, education, biotech, financial services, manufacturing, software development. So I've done pretty much everything and worked with every type of organization you can ever think of. Um, but my fun fact, um, when I tell people they don't want my emails, um, I spearfish. So I actually swim in the ocean and catch fish. If you want to reach out to me on LinkedIn, my information's there and, and my email address. And since everyone has been here last, everybody that's a, re you can do the little hand raise thing. Anybody been to a workshop before? Anybody? You can tap the little thing. Okay, yeah, most of us here. Uh, but since the last uh, workshop, Benjamin also had a birthday. Happy birthday, Benjamin. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, I'm a little bit older now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm, I'm Josh, I work with Benjamin and all these other uh, talking heads on the screen that you're looking at. Um, uh, my background's a little bit different. It's more of the academic side and doing a lot of research and profile mapping of threat actors, in particular, the way the economics of the exchange work. Um, and that sort of goes into cryptocurrencies and the way that uh, underground markets behave, uh, the economic pressures and things like that, that uh, constitute that cyber criminal under, underground. So that's sort of my background uh, and area. So um, Risk IQ, now Microsoft, uh, excited to be here today to show you what we can do to uh, uh, unmask and defeat adversaries. So yeah, and now um, I want to um, bring on our uh, one of our colleagues, yeah. Yanni from uh, Microsoft. Hey guys, happy happy to be here. I'm like a guest uh, here. <laughs> My name is uh, Yaniv Shasha, and I'm a senior program manager at uh, Microsoft uh, at the cross product integration. Uh, and I'm new at the uh, US, uh, uh, just relocated uh, around three or four months, uh, have some experience in, in uh, IT, general IT and in the cybersecurity. So currently located in Redmond. And my, my fun fact is 
part of the relocation and getting to know the culture, I'm like spending a lot of time of learning, you know, American sports, still struggling with some rules on baseball. And uh, so I, I'm hoping that our demo and our product flow will be easier than, you know, understanding baseball rules for me. <laughs> it's, it's easier than cricket. So you'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> happy, happy to be here. guys. Glad to have you. Yes. And now we have uh, another colleague, um, um, Mark Hendrick. Hello there, everyone. Um, so I am, I'm really excited to be with everyone here. Uh, this is uh, evidence of my uh, ineffectiveness evading uh, Ben and Josh uh, and their attempt to always pull me into these things. Uh, but it's, uh, it's something I enjoy doing. I love sharing. I love um, working to scale up everyone's capabilities and also learning from those on the front lines. I have uh, really nearly about 20 years of uh, software product development, um, worked uh, originally, fun fact on that, for the company that made the steel for the Seattle Space Needle. Um, of course, that was before I think I was even born, but anyway. Um, so worked in uh, kind of that manufacturing and process improvement thing, really worked at a company that's kind of a long, was early in their digital transformation journey, um, and then worked for a company in that didn't start out in cybersecurity, uh, but ended up there and did a lot of integrations work for them. And now most recently, um, first with Risk IQ and then coming into Microsoft as part of that. Uh, I do listen best on ports 43 and 53, so keep that in mind if you want to communicate with me. And yeah, looking forward to sharing with you um, whatever it is that uh, we can. And again, hoping for opportunities to learn from all of you. So leverage the chat, ask questions, and uh, let's make this as collaborative as we can. Um, and with that, I'm going to drink some more coffee so that I can sound intelligent a little bit later on here. And then uh, we have Alex helping with all the questions uh, that might come in and she'll interrupt us and ask us questions live from the chat. So you wanna say hi, Alex, and introduce yeah. yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me, Benjamin. So my name's Alex Roland. I'm a program manager here at Microsoft. Um, previously, my role at Risk IQ was um, a technical um, solutions architect. So I would help with pre and post sales engineering. I would advise our customers on different integration use cases in terms of using our data within their SIM EDR. Um, so now I'm going to be moving into more of a, a product and program management role at, at Microsoft here. Um, in terms of fun facts, I actually traveled overseas for the first few years of my life. Um, didn't make it to the States until I was about three years old. So the only continents I haven't hit up have been South America and Antarctica. Cool. Now we know where to send you for your birthday. <laughs> South America would be <laughs> okay. All right, I was going to send you to the Penguins. So um, one, uh, so one lucky um, attendee today is going to receive a hundred dollar American Express gift card, and we'll announce it towards the end. So uh, please stay towards the end and uh, see if you're the winner. And we'll kick off some poll questions. Josh, do you want to start them off? Yeah, once upon a time when we used to breathe the same air we would ask these kinds of questions in a physical setting from like a stage or a big conference room or auditorium or something. And just to get a lay of who's in the room, we're gonna go through some pretty interesting labs today, but how you approach it really could vary based on your role and your experience with these kinds of concepts and, and kind of data and systems and all that. So what we try to do is just get a lay of who's in the room. Um, so just first up is how, what, what's your experience with threat intelligence? How long have you used threat intelligence? Just as a, as a, a first question out there. Um, and we do have uh, polls coming up here. Should pop up. There it goes. There it goes. Have you attended a workshop before? I've been here. Yeah, we've been here before. That was the, the technical first one. <laughs> have you been here before? Which I know we had mentioned earlier with the little hand raise, but nobody did. So <laughs> there's a few, there's a few people. Oh, there were? Oh, they, that's great. Yeah. I missed them. So we'll just give that a couple seconds. And and this is going to be recorded. And all of the things that we're going to show, if we show any scripts, those will all be, um, links will be sent out to all of that afterwards. So um, copies of the slides as well will be given out too. Yeah. So we'll close that. And let's see what kind of. Audience so about 65% have attended before, 35 have not. 35. Okay. 
And then just real quickly, those that um, may or may not have been here, just your, your level of experience with threat intelligence. And we sort of have a, a good smattering across this many times. Um, and so could be a newcomer, could be new to this, could be a, a wily veteran who knows all the, the tricks and tips. It could be like a, a Mark Kendrick, you know, um, where you, you've been around this stuff forever. You see binary in your sleep, you know, that, that can happen. And we'll close it out there and uh, get everybody's results. Okay, so the um, less than two years, 33%, two to five years, 33%. Um, more than five years, 33%, and um, never 2%. So pretty even, okay. and, first and, time ever. And also with some exposure. Right. Even and some exposure. That's really right. interesting. You know, normally we have a little bit more tilted toward the newcomer. So that's right. exciting to know that folks right. here, we're going to go into a little bit more advanced use cases today. Uh, so that's actually good to know uh, that you have a little bit more familiarity. And then last one real quick, which stress do you care the most about? Now we talk about adversary threat infrastructure and we're going to get into some ransomware stuff here in a sec. Don't let that bias you. But which ones of these are, are uh, the most, uh, or actually you can choose multiples, but just any that apply, but the, the threats you care most about. Yeah. And, and the use cases that we picked today are things that you would do in a daily, your daily job. Right, right. So Ordinary. I tried to show how that we could, we could do those um, with the tools that we have available to show full loop of what you could do. Yeah, because that's what frees up capacity to when the real big incident occurs, right. uh, you know? And so uh, we'll go ahead and close that one out now that folks have had a chance to, I'm curious on this one, because for over a year, okay. when we've asked this question, there's been one thing that's been the Friends number one is number problem. One. And there it is, keeps going. Um, okay, it's, so officially been, it's officially been a year, Benjamin. Yeah. Our, our workshop this time, the last yep. week of March, a year ago, that's when it became the number one yep. slot and it has stayed there every single workshop since. So then followed by insider threats. Oops. Oh, and, it, okay. And then um, we have brand abuse, uh, nation state, mm -hmm. um, domestic cyber, um, and then hacktivists and uh, espionage. Okay. okay. All right. So... Th and we have one last question. Good. That helps us get, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. We have one last question. Oh, yes. Apologies. Yes. Thank you. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Do you, or do you consider, okay. Do you consider your um, uh, malware fish and do you, um, investigations reactive or proactive? They're both. How do you, how do you handle those? Are you stopping them before they start? Um, only after you know about them, you know, mm -hmm. what, what do you do? Yeah, and I, mean, think, I think we have one extra question after this too. Mike, okay. we'll to know. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, and which proactive can look just as much as spotting those uh, infrastructures early and putting in right. the appropriate blocks and protections. Um, and reactive can look just as simple, you know, not necessarily problematic as um, you have a, uh, a phishing alert that you then go to investigate a, a bit further to see what infrastructure may be involved, what other weaponization has happened that's related and so on. Um, but we'll go ahead and it's more of just which end are you starting from? Okay. And uh, both 64% followed by reactive and then proactive. There's okay. going to be a mix every, every day, day in and day out. So last question. I actually just got a note that there's two more. Two more. Yeah. Same here. All right. Okay. okay. What, yeah. what SIM um, are you using the SIM? Which one? Um, I just wanted to know because I've, in my past lives, I've worked with all of them. And I just want to see, I can put things in terms of maybe those products. Yeah, because we're going to be doing some integration back and forth between SIM today. Obviously, we're going to be working uh, that with Microsoft Sentinel. That's not to say that there isn't a risk IQ integration to other places and, and uh, folks. And so, uh, yeah, I, Benjamin and I both kind of SIM background, so happy to translate to any of these you're familiar with. Employee number two at uh, 40 SIM, when it was like sell ops, help Ooh. come up with that concept. And we'll close it out there. Yeah. Uh, Sentinel, okay. Um, Splunk, 30%, Q Radar, um, 
and no love for 40 sim. Okay. And uh, uh, <laughs> no. 22% other. Okay. Very yeah. cool. All so, right. And then lastly, sorry, folks, I just want to make sure we're contextualizing everything because it's, again, a very advanced use cases today. We'll make sure we have everybody here. And that's. Uh, in what ways is, is your organization proactive in investigations? Okay. Do you deploy endpoint protection, patch frequently, educate your staff on the dangers of malware and fish, subscribe to phishing and malware feeds, research threats, and you can choose multiple ones. Five, four, three, two, one. We'll close it out. I imagine a lot of people are going to check multiples there. Okay, endpoint protection, 92%. Very good. Patch frequently, great. Educate, 86. And then uh, they get feeds and then they research threats. So great. Across yeah. the board. Yeah. Which is sort of the, uh, <clears throat> the, the scope of of treatment to the problem that you would expect, you know, first to the protection of the endpoint and then all the way down to researching the threats, you know, before they actually become an attack. Um, right. So uh, yeah, th that continuum there. So here we are folks, there, there's your introduction and us like getting introduced to you, getting to know us and then us getting to know you. Um, but Benjamin, I know these are some pretty interesting topics that we wanted to get into today. Why don't you take people through the agenda and then okay. we'll, we'll jump into this stuff. So we're going to talk about um, ransomware and credential harvesting. And those kind of go hand in hand. They're, they're very similar. Just one of them steals your credentials to do bad. And the other one might steal your credentials and, and ruin everything once they steal stuff. Um, so it, they're very similar. So I kind of put them together. So this could be like human operated where somebody is going and targeting a person and doing an attack. It could be something that's automated where it's, spray and pray where they're throwing a big net and looking, uh, exploiting a vulnerability in order to do something. Or um, somebody is renting uh, a kit or using a, a, a open source kit or a free kit in order to go and do some attacks. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna be examining that, examining the, an attack um, inside of Sentinel and with Risk IQ enriching but then we're going to even look at doing some threat intelligence inside of Risk IQ and coming back to see if there was any hits internally. And then if there was, going through that process of closing the loop to fix it. And we'll go from the perspective of looking from research, looking from uh, a fish kit, loading bad stuff and seeing what other domains are loading that bad stuff. Or from the other perspective is the fish kits also have to load good things. Mm -hmm. So they load up, you know, the images from Microsoft or Adobe or from uh, Google or um, different organizations that they're attacking. So you can look from that perspective to see what's being loaded and who's loading it and finding the bad stuff from there. Right. Um, and then the way that you protect your organization is by having multi-factor authentication. And this saved my butt on my personal account. And so I'll go through that attack and I grabbed all the IP addresses where the logins came from all around the world. I was very popular. And then um, they got in and it, I got a little pop-up saying, hey, did you just log in from Minneapolis? And I deny. Mm -hmm. And I stopped the attack. And then I was able to drop off, finish dropping off my son at school and getting back. And we'll investigate and see what correlations are together and who that threat actor might be. Yeah, and so I was surprised to find it. And no spoiler yeah. alerts. No, I'm, no I'm spoiler. Gonna, <laughs> and I, again, I'm sorry that that happened to you, but it is, a, it is an illustration in, in the positive, correct thing happening. You know? yes. So real quick overview, folks, for those of you, especially that might be new here. <clears throat> so my, this is a ball. Very simple concept here. So there's two sides of this ball when it comes to the things we have to worry about in our digital estate. The device side, we're typical, we're used to that, right? Something happens, something bad, something triggers. We then do an investigation, apply intelligence, do an analysis, and then ultimately scale a protection you know, out to all. So these commoditized or homogenous things that we can apply a single protection for, um, it's not as simple on the orange side of the ball, which is the digital part of uh, that landscape because something that happens out there it's not ours right it's it's on they're swimming on the internet 
Um, and I don't know how it necessarily relates. I need to graph relationships and who's who and what's what and what enforcement, control, power, authority, ownership does exist out there on the internet and who's doing what and obfuscating their own behavior. Um, but then being able to apply that to, yes, to all of the internet. Um, because ultimately, a lot of things that can be fingerprinted that are adversarial in nature, we can avoid getting entangled with on the internet. And that's how we can shield ourselves. We can shield ourselves both as our digital estate grows and expands into that ether of the internet. And also we can defang what's out there by pinpointing it early, which we're gonna get into that weaponization and identifying it early um, as again, spoiler alert, when it comes to the, the lab stuff. Um, but because the thing is, is that they're already out there. Right now, we're all going through digital transformation, right? We're all pushing out into the internet. Oh, that nice big open space out here. They've been there for decades, right? And they have to use the internet. But Benjamin, I know this is a concept that's really near and dear to your, your heart. So why don't you take people yeah. through what we mean by that? We all play on the same battlefield. We're on the, we have to play by the same rules. We're all on the internet. And with that, there's signals. Everyone who goes on the internet can avoid signals the good and the bad. And because of that, if we collect those signals and enough of them, we can fingerprint them and, and identify the infrastructure and who's behind stuff. So just from going on the internet, you have an IP address, there's a net block, uh, an um, autonomous system number, and an ISP that you'll be using. When you create an email, you're gonna use a provider. You'll have a subject, a body, uh, headers, there'll be timestamps, uh, attachments, even probably a language. Um, and then when it's, the email is sent, you get the transit IPs, the transit net blocks, the, the ASNs it goes through, the timing, so you know about like when it was sent, what part of the world. Um, and then when it's received, it could be an HTML email. There will be a read receipt, uh, a read notification perhaps. Uh, you'll know the uh, server IP address, the host name, um, um, the location of uh, where the reader was. Uh, potentially and even a gateway IP address of where that um, user was connecting. Now, when the email is rendered, there could be some binaries, um, external uh, requests for information from H uh, HTML type stuff. There'll be some dependencies. You might click on things. There'll be some redirects potentially. Um, and then once there's a compromise, um, that IP address um, is now used to be able to go and scan and, and access, you know, uh, internal systems and uh, execute commands and run programs to do bad or to scan. Um, and those tactics, techniques, and procedures are documented. So then you know about the threat actor and you can identify them and you can stop them. But this is what everyone goes through. And this is um, the common things that happen that if you collect these things, you can do good with them to prevent it. And so what Risk IQ does is goes out on the internet, on the open internet, and grabs all this public available information, uh, and we do it at scale. So when we look at like services, phishing, passive yeah. DNS, JavaScripts, um, um, the, the active DNS, the banners, the who is information, the open ports, you know, we do about 2 um, billion web requests a day. And we, we have over 106 billion unique DNS records. Um, we, we see about 5.5 million new host resolutions a day, um, along with, um, 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 sorry, along with um, new domains that just pop up. We also um, observe over um, 250 different ports and we see about 300,000 new port observations daily. And we also look at all the different mobile app stores around the world and we have over 34 million mobile apps in our, our inventory. So with that information that we have, think of it this way is every single day that we've collected the new piece of, of the internet, what we observed from the day before, it gives us the chance to merge that with the existing data. And when we do that merge, we can actually roll back um, a new observation to the beginning of time forward. It's like a time machine. So like if we found out that there was a piece of data that was on a, a document object model, we can actually go back to the very beginning of when we collected and roll that forward and find that data and link it together to find new um, infrastructure chains together to be able to find these things. So our researchers um, will go through and talk to the data scientists and come up with these ways of doing this machine learning and uh, identification and figure out this threat infrastructure. And then when we merge that together, 
we can actually uh, get smarter. It's not just like a regular sim when you go put a rule in, tell me if you see this going forward, we can go back to the beginning of time and, and roll that forward. So there are data sets that we're gonna go through are pretty spectacular because we've gathered the data ourselves. So we know what comes in and goes out to every website. So the host pair information is highly useful. Trackers, all the little bits of codes and all these derived data sets that we create allow us to be able to have this information and make it available to you to find and stop these threats. One so thing that I want to, one thing, Benjamin, I want to just really underscore right here too. Uh -huh. um, and I think it's, it's so important for us to remember this, you know, we're, we're talking about all of this internet centric perspective. We're talking about things and it may seem a little bit kind of self-evident, like, of course, this stuff's on the internet. And of course there's data to be had here. What I have found is that although everybody seems to know that these attacks come from this thing called the internet, the visibility within your own network, within your own infrastructure, to the way that your people are interacting with these resources, that's a level of visibility that a lot of folks just haven't invested in the time or the effort to really bring forward, be able to operationalize it, and be able to put it in the hands of, of their defenders. And that's a lot of what we are going to be talking about today and what we're actually going to be able to show you sort of end to end. But it's also a little bit on you folks that are listening to this. Um, to kind of question, do we have good visibility end to end to the full scope of internet infrastructure that people are interacting, that my people are interacting with? And making sure that you have all of those pieces there, that's gonna make this data that we have up here on the slide even more relevant to you because right. we're basically gonna help kind of pull that in and merge that together. And Benjamin, that's largely kind of what we're, what we're aiming right. to do here today, right? Right. So, so what we're going to be able to do is, you know, like once we find something bad, we'll be able to, to build that infrastructure chain together to say, this is all the bad stuff. And now apply protections or tell me if somebody visited any of this infrastructure that we saw and then do the remediation steps to be able to take care of it. So when we look at the data that, that Risk IQ as a company has, it's, it's during the setup and weaponization phases that we... Um, generally have all, we're, we're gathering all this stuff just like a threat actor would, but we have it on an ongoing basis for you. So then you can use this information to see how you look at, look like on the internet or your third parties or people that you're dealing with. But we also have this ability to look at the threat actor in their tooling and see where it is and what's happening so you can apply those controls inside. You know, Benjamin, but, one of the things I like to emphasize on that MITRE ATT&CK framework, if any, I hope the folks have kind of um, taken a look and, and seen this, but if you've ever gone through and kind of clicked in, especially on the reconnaissance steps and like, okay, as a defender, I wanna make sure like, what's my role in here when these reconnaissance activities are happening? They're kind of depressing. Like you click on them and, and you know, during things like um, maybe gathering victim information, email addresses, or maybe looking at domain and DNS properties, they actually say, as a network defender, there's really not much you can do. You're really just waiting until the bad thing happens. That's what we want to challenge because we don't think you need to wait. We think that you can actually be actively involved even at those phases, even though the attacker is coming and, and is, is preparing their campaign sort of from the internet's perspective. What we're going to show you today is how you can actually put some of those same capabilities in your hand instead of being passive and waiting until your click happy CFO starts having bad things happening on their machine and money going places that it shouldn't. Well, why not get involved sooner? And that, Benjamin, is really what we're offering yeah. today. Yeah. So what we're going to be doing is showing about the inside perspective like the SIM has and the outside perspective that we have and merge those together to make a complete picture. So then you can do a full investigation, you can do full threat analysis and bring that back in and take action. So that's what we're gonna show you. Um, the scripts that we're using are, are real, you're gonna get copies of them and we'll show you how you can implement those if you're using um, um, Sentinel um, or if you're running Jupyter, you'll be able to run these same things in Jupyter. So um, Josh, do you wanna take over on this slide? Oh yeah, just a couple of things. So there's a link in this to everybody that takes you to the connector. That's an important one, bottom right on this slide. So when it goes out to everybody, just there's a live link to make sure you get to the docs.microsoft.com page. So that way you can go ahead and um, use it. Um, four bullet points on the right. It's curated OSINT that we've enriched with additional things that we found on the internet because we're constantly staring at it. Um, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second point is that we're, we can have some pre-built 
uh, risk indicators, playbooks, workbooks, notebooks, and so forth when it comes to how we're monitoring these kinds of fingerprints that we're channeling into something like a SIM. Um, the, the reason that we're uh, able to keep tabs on these things is because it's live tracking. Uh, it's constantly observing what's happening on the internet, threat behavior, entanglements, how the relationships of the internet are dynamically changing, how the reputation of that relationship dynamically changes, because every little breath on the internet is another digital something uh, that influences the factors and attributes on whether something's dangerous, uh, unknown, or malicious itself. Um, and then finally, uh, being able to... Uh, to unmask them in those places. There is a whole lot, to Mark's point, there's a whole lot in that reconnaissance area and a whole lot that you're told there's nothing you can do about it. I will just plainly say right now to the folks on this call, that's just myth. It's just wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because we do it every day. I have personal experience doing it every day. The people on this call do it every day. Um, and so uh, there is something you can do about it. Um, and you can, again, safeguard and put a shield around your own digital estate as it presses into this expanse of space that is infested with danger. Um, and you can defang that danger as you progress into that internet ether. So that's the main point here. So those are the, the key usual suspects you're gonna get when you're using the threat intelligence. Um, so I just wanna give you kind of a quick synopsis of what the different parts are as we get into the labs. Um, but go ahead, Benjamin, because this is very directed about very uh, precise ransomware cases today. So, so um... We're going to do, we mentioned the ransomware, uh, we're going to be doing um, a credential harvesting attack, and then we're going to do a threat investigation. Uh, and that will be three different um, notebooks um, will be involved with that, plus the UI. And then we'll do uh, a hands-on investigation into the multi-factor uh, attack. So um, Alex, if you can throw the credentials in for everybody, so you'll have the link in the passwords to get in. And, and I don't imagine that many people have a lack of familiarity with uh, Jupiter, but there is that notebook uh, capability we'll go through as well. I think most folks here are familiar with Jupiter. Everybody? Anybody not familiar? Because I know some folks said, yeah, I've used Sentinel before, so that one kind of is an easy apply. The other aspect of this, we're going to show it in Jupiter. Everybody here mostly familiar with Jupiter? We had one hand, so that's good. I, we anybody not? Anybody not who needs a, a quick primer on it as we get into that lab? Yeah, so we'll we'll go through and explain. So if there works, we'll go through and we'll build it up and show you how the notebooks work and, and how it goes. Yeah, so so we'll be using um, community.riskiq.com, Illuminate. Um, we'll be showing uh, Sentinel and Jupyter Notebooks in the future. We wanna make the, the, the Microsoft Sentinel and the Jupyter Notebooks interactive. So we're still building that out. But uh, in the in the future, that's what we're we're building towards. So we can everyone can do the same hands-on things. Uh, but for right now, when we get into the central piece in the Jupiter, we'll be showing you those things and handing them over at the end of the workshop. Uh, but the things that we do inside of Risk IQ, uh, Illuminate, you'll be able to follow along, and we'll give you the links, and you can click and you can use them. And the disclaimer, do you want to go through the disclaimer? Oh, yeah, this is the fun part. Yeah, lawyers rule the world, okay? Um, but we also weren't playing around when we said that this is live internet, real stuff, and that it changes all the time. We're actually working with actual real things on the actual real internet. Um, and so when that happens, through these live observations of real threat indicators, um, you could bump into things that could be problematic. So risk IQ, risk IQ, risk IQ will share <laughs> online resources like IP addresses, domain names that should be considered real threats posing a clear and present danger. Okay, you've now been told. Um, we want you to use your best judgment, but we're all professionals here. Um, everybody, right? We have a lot of veterans here today. Um, so we know what to do. Uh, we know how to put buffers between us and adversary, but uh, lawyers of the world. So we have to put it out there. Don't go to any of these domains directly or IP addresses. You want to use a buffer like, like Risk IQ Illuminate. Uh, mm -hmm. We might even show URL scan IO to bring up an image, but we're doing, we're using a tool that goes there. So you don't, so you, if something happens, you don't get infected and bring this bad thing into your organization. So we're ready to start. So Yaniv, um, um, we're going to be starting a second. So this is the scenario that we have. So business email compromise. An email comes in, uh, Carla gets it on her machine. She clicks on it and she enters her credentials to the malicious credential harvesting website. 
What could that, possibly go wrong? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my, my, my sharing, but everything that we show we in the slides, we're going to have step-by-step -step of what happens and how it works. And we'll be publishing this to GitHub that you can download them and you can run it through to your uh, own environment as well to practice and, and see these things. Um, so that will be available in the future. Uh, but for right now, the, the, um, all of the notebooks that we do inside of Sentinel or outside of Sentinel um, will be available and those will be shared and we'll have those. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And just as the screen says there, folks, we're gonna start in Sentinel in this case, like we were talking about those two different directions, starting in Sentinel and then head, you know, starting at the security analytic, again, it could be another sim, but in this case, Sentinel, and then heading into a deeper investigation to explode mm -hmm. it out. Um, and then we'll go the other direction uh, in another lab. Okay, uh, hello, thank you, Benjamin, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so are you able to see my Sentinel screen? Yes. We can. Okay, cool. So welcome to the Cloud Native Sim, Microsoft Sentinel. Mm -hmm. uh, so even before I will jump to the business email compromise uh, scenario, I, I want to show you the, the level of integration that we have with uh, Risk IQ today. And, and to do so, let me navigate to the Content Hub section in Azure Sentinel. And Content Hub, it's like App Store of uh, Microsoft Sentinel that, that show the integration level that we have with the uh, uh, vendors around mm -hmm. the industry. It's not only vendor specific, uh, you can see also uh, uh, vulnerability specific packages. And, and it's basically a place that you can manage the life cycle of a content around the, the, the specific uh, uh, subject. And when I said life cycle, it means that we are packaging the content and the, all the artifacts that we are uh, uh, developing around this product. And, and you can install it, you can update it, uh, and you can uh, uh, manage it. So it. But we are here for discussing Risk IQ and, and Microsoft Sentinel. So let me just type Risk IQ in the search bar. And as you can see, we have the, the Risk IQ solution here. And the level of integration that we have with uh, Microsoft Sentinel is in the form of a playbooks. We have 27 playbooks that, that some of them is come with the incident trigger, meaning that every time that we have a new security incident, we are running a playbook, a security playbook that integrate with Risk IQ API and portal and pulling the right data and enrich and give context, and you will see it in a moment. And we have the other type of trigger is that it happened very similarly, but only on alert trigger. Every time that a new alert, and, and the concept between alerts and incident, I can point you to a resources in Sentinel to, to understand when to run alert and when to run an incident trigger. So we have 27 playbooks around the, the solution. The installation of the solution is pretty easy. And, and, and if we have an update, you will just need to update the solution. So let me jump into the incident screen. So I'm Yaniv, I'm a SOC analyst that, that sit on the security incident screen. I can check the auto refresh option that the new incident come flowing in a live matter. And, and I want to show you the, the scenario that we uh, prepare for you today uh, about the business email compromise scenario. So in, in my incident queue, I can see a new high severity incident with incident ID. And the title is the financial fraud with a business email compromise attack. I can see that the, the, the incident itself is coming from Microsoft Sentinel. Basically we have our rule engine that run as a search-based sim, we run on top of the event itself. And when we have a match, we are rising a incident. In our case, in the right pane, let me just assign this incident to myself, uh, to myself, let me apply because I will going to manage this incident. Uh, I can see that maybe I would change it to active because I'm, I'm working on the incident. And uh, I can see immediately that I have entities and entities, it's like a, a, a type, a bucket type that, that we can work and we can do automation and we can do enrichment and investigation. And in my case, I have a user entity and for Carla, she is the victim here on the story. I have a suspicious host name that we shortly will see how it play along. 
and I have a suspicious IP that basically this is like the, the IP that, that we communicate. So another thing that I'm seeing here is a tag. This is like a labeling that we are adding to the incident itself to add a contextual data. Uh, in my case, we run automatically playbook on top of the user entity, Carla, and we check because Carla is, is working on the finance uh, org, uh, and, and we know that we have a higher risk with user that is part of this department. So we are doing a matching between the department and a watch list uh, that hold the VIP user that we have in the organization, the, the level of damage that can happen if someone compromise Carla user is higher. And this is the reason that we add the VIP user. Uh, we can also change severity. We can also change the title to reflect this level of information. But in, in this case, we just added the tag and me as a SOC analyst know that I need to investigate this incident quicker than the other because I'm dealing with a, a VIP user. Another thing that we are seeing here is the comments and I will di dive deeper in the comments later. So let me open the view full details of the incident. I'm navigating now to the incident page. I can see the, the same left side, left side pen, uh, but I also notice that I have the section of the comments. And, and the comments is the area that we are surfacing all the great findings that, that we bring and pull from Risk IQ. And, and you can see that I have three different comments. And, and every time that a new incident created, I'm calling a security playbook that going to the Risk IQ and pull the data in. So they are taking the, in, in our case, they are taking the IP from this incident and they are doing resolution of this IP against risk IQ. And you can see the, the level of integration and the result that we are getting from this IP. Uh, we are dealing with a real scenario here. So we are seeing all the resolution, the, the certificate, the cookies, the DNS, all the data, the contextual data that the analysts need and, and it's our face. And if you want, he can, he can press and navigate to the risk IQ portal and see the, the data. Benjamin will, will, will touch it later, so I will skip it for now. A another playbook that run automatically is the domain alert, uh, the summary of the domain. So we are taking the domain entities here and we are basically uh, into, uh, pulling it or, or resolving it from risk IQ. And indeed, and this is the critical part here, Indeed, we are seeing that this bad domain is part of a fish kit article that the security researcher that Benjamin and the team discussed about it uh, did some work and, and, and research and, and they add this domain as part of the IOC that yeah. involved in this fish kit. Yeah, uh, can I say something? So like, sure, think of sure. it this way. Um, Sentinel went out and pulled out the information from like Z, Zscaler and said, hey, um, there was traffic that went to this domain. And when we went and we enriched it, we go that domain actually that was in that URL actually was mentioned in this article. So you can see threat article results for that domain, which was a vagabond fish kit. So that means that that domain was, was named as like an indicator inside of that article. So now you know, ooh, so this is involved mm -hmm. with the fish kit. So you go, hey, this is not good. And then when you look at the IP address, the IP address was the DNS resolution for that. So that was the IP that responded for that domain. But it's the only it's it's suspicious because it might host many, many, many different domains, but only one was really bad. So the other ones are it's, so that's why the, the score isn't that good for the IP, but the domain is definitely bad because it was mentioned in that article. Okay, thanks, thanks for adding this. Yeah. And, and let me show you. So, so you mentioned uh, Zscaler. So let me show you the, the, the investigation flow that, that we are seeing and the evidence that we are seeing in the logs. So in, in Azure Sentinel, beside, of course, uh, the incident screen, we have way to interact with the actual raw data that we ingested into the, into the product. So in our case, I'm querying the common security log. This is like the tables and we are using KQL who stock query language behind the scene to retrieve the data um, 
and, and to query and ask questions about the data. So in, in my case, I query the common security log, the, uh, the Ceph uh, table, and I'm looking for a destination IP because I know that based on the resolution that RISC-IQ gave me on the bad domain, the resolution of the IP is uh, 173.236. And, and, and I, indeed, I found the result that showing the actual click of Carla on the on the malicious or the fish email and the interaction with the bad domain, the 173. So one evidence. You see the you see the 200 for the HTML. So you say, okay, it was it was allowed. It was successful. The HTTP connection. Yeah. Indeed, and I see the the destination DNS domain. I can see the full URL that come in as part of the email itself, and I can see the affected the username that actually press press on the on the result. I can do some other enrichment and check Carla and see a. Uh, other other uh, properties on it, but let's jump to the second one. So after a couple of hours, you see it's like two hours later in the middle of the night, we can see we are querying now the security event table and security event collecting us the data that, that store in uh, event viewer. It can be also coming uh, on the Windows event table. And I'm querying here the workstation. I can query different fields, but in this case, I'm querying the, the endpoint, the the PC itself of Carla, and I'm checking all the successful login that happened on Carla v, uh, machine in, a, in the last 24 hours. So in, in our case, we are seeing that we have a successful login from Carla after two hours that she pressed on the, on the malicious email. And the IP that, that the login came from is the 213. So totally different IP that someone log in from, from uh, to Carla machine. Uh, and, and indeed it's a successful login. So let's continue with the investigation. What, what I can do now is I can, I can check uh, or I can see another evidence of the same successful login and I'm querying now the same firewall uh, table. In this case, I'm having a different firewall that this is my edge firewall. Uh, that every every traffic inbound traffic that entering in my case is uh, RDP port and we can see the RDP port from the same IP to Carla machine so this is the internal IP of Carla machine and I, indeed I can see that successful login uh, happened on the same time from this IP so yet another evidence that show me a, a, a new login from this IP but let, let's find the IP. Maybe, maybe I have the IP in my Thread Intelligent uh, table. So Azure Sentinel has a TI Thread Intelligent indicator. But when I check this IOC, I cannot find it. I cannot find the IOC. And, and uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, Benjamin, are we able to find it in, in the Risk IQ? Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Uh, we can search it and see it. Okay, yeah. so let, let's search it. So let me open a different uh, different uh, tab and let me search the risk IQ. So I'm not sure. Yeah, and indeed, and indeed, we find resolution. Benjamin, help me. So, so right see. now we we don't. Okay, there it goes. Now we see your screen. So like if we look at this, the information that's coming back. Um, if we scroll up to the top, let's take a look. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. So now we we're getting some information about this particular. Um, uh, domain. It's in Russia. So we're, we're getting a login from Russia. Um, and um, if we notice now, it says Cobalt Strike. Oh. So this is a command and control IP address associated with Cobalt Strike because we've identified the infrastructure that's out there running Cobalt Strike. We have over 8,000 indicators that Risk IQ has collected that no one else knows about. There's only about 2,400 that are published. So we know about 10,000 of them. And this now tells me, oh, I got a successful login from a command and control from Russia that was a Cobalt Strike um, proxy or, or entity. So now that's now high level that now I have this threat intel. Now you could push this into oh. um, um, Sentinel directly from here if you wanted to. So inside okay. the Microsoft tab, so inside of your account settings, you can enter the, inf uh, the information to link it to your endpoint and link it into Sentinel. 
So at this point, I can now make an alert to push it back in just by clicking on that. You want me to click it, Benjamin? Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this, this indicates the bidirectional integration that we have with Sentinel. We are not only pulling data from Risk IQ, we are able also to push data from Azure Sentinel into from Risk IQ into the, the same table that, that I just uh, queried. So now we have a new IOC that come in on this Cobalt Strike uh, IP, and I can use it uh, to enrich and to enlighten other uh, incident and other data sources with this uh, a great uh, IOC that come from uh, that came from uh, Risk IQ. Okay, let let me come back to Sentinel and let the the story evolve a bit. Uh, let me choose the right tab. Okay, so we know we know that we have successful login with IP. Uh, from Cobalt Strike, let's let's see what the the actor, the bad actor, did on Carla machine. And for that, I'm going back to security event, same table, querying the same workstation of uh, Carla. But now I'm looking for process creation event 4688. And what I'm seeing here, I'm seeing that the bad actors doing a new process. And, and, and help me, what we are seeing here, end map. End map. It's really yes. an end map. So he's doing like, he's scanning my internal network and you can see the, the IP, the target IP that he's scanning. Uh, this is my domain controller, just uh, to notice. So we are seeing the evolution of the attack and the same on behalf of Carla, the attacker uses like a, a discovery tools to, to make a lateral movement maybe. So as a SOC analyst, I understand that I'm dealing with something bad. I have all the evidence, I can collect them, but now I need to operate quick. And our SOAR uh, security orchestration, automation and response part on the product itself, not help us only to bring data from a different uh, uh, system like RISC-IQ, but it also help us to operate and do some remediation on the, on, the, on the incident itself. So let me go to the alert itself and let me uh, write the view playbook, and this is the security playbook that we can run on top of them. And let me do some active remediation on the entities that is part of the incident. And the first that one that I want to do is I want to isolate the, uh, uh, the MTP, uh, the, the Carla machine, basically. So I, I want to run the Carla machine. I'm running it, let me close it. And now I'm using a uh, Defender for Defender 365 to isolate it from the network. So I, I deal with the, with the machine itself. What I want to do more is I want to block also the, the Carla user because I know that the attacker now is using, uh, is using Carla credential to do uh, bad stuff on my, on my system. So let me block the user in AAD and we can do it also in, in AD itself in on-prem AD, we have the template. We have a variety of uh, templates for playbooks that you can do a uh, remediation. And the last thing that I want to, to do is I want to block the IP also in my edge firewall. So I have a 40 gate firewall and all this playbook that I'm showing you here today is a, is a, a built in playbooks that you can consume. And let me find, I'm not able to find my 40 gate, but uh, believe me that is there. So I want to block it, but we have a built-in connector that help us to block IPs on a variety of, uh, of uh, firewalls from Palo Alto, from FortiGate. Uh, so in, in, the past, in the past, what you'd have to do is you'd have to open up a ticket with the network group to say, here's the domain or the IP address we want you to block and the reason why. And you would have to wait a period of time of maybe a few minutes to a few hours for that to happen. This is so nice to be able to have the the ability to send the right command and do it directly from the interface. And, and, and from work with other big customer, we know that sometimes as part of this playbook, you need to add some de decision port because me as a SOC analyst, maybe sometimes I'm not allowed to block the, the, the port in the firewall. So I need someone from the network team to, to approve it. And it's very easy to do it with this security playbook. You're just sending an email, exposing a button. And if you press yes, I can continue to the actual block. Okay. So that's it. We close in the loop. We did remediation. Uh, back to you, Benjamin. 
Okay. So real quick, well, before we switch over to Benjamin, yeah, um, yes. to I want to go a little bit off script here just to address a question that was in chat, which I think is important. Yanev, would it be possible for you to show us the analytic rule that generated that incident? Exactly. Um, okay. And so while he's bringing that up, the question in chat, just to really bring this in the context, um, is kind of pulling this thread of, well, now, hold on, how did we get visibility to that, um, that external IP? And this is important because what you'll find is that oftentimes, and if you go to your, um, yes, there you go, your entity mapping, and there we go. So if a lot of times what you'll find is that the solutions, the predefined um, analytic rules and so on will do a good job of giving you the internal IP address. And that's all. And when you go to run your incident, um, then you'll see in the list of entities that you have access to, in this case, Carla's internal IP. But you might not have access to that external IP address that she interacted with, even though the data is actually in the logs. And so that's where, in the context of Sentinel, it becomes important to actually go in here and make sure that you have an IP address entity that is going to be created from the destination IP. The destination IP was in the logs, it just might not be mapped into an entity by default. Again, you're, you might have a different scenario if you're using a, a different SIM, but inside of Sentinel, this is where you would go to make sure that you're bringing that data in. So Yash, thank you for bringing that up in chat. Hopefully that's helpful in there. I just really wanted to underscore um, the, the actual place where you're doing this. This is also, by the way, where the destination DNS domain is at. Um, and if you are deploying this um, for specifically for use with some prepackaged playbooks, including the Risk IQ uh, playbooks that are happening in here, you will want to make sure you create and map those to host full name entities. There's a few different variations in those. We can guide you through that. If you have any questions on that, reach out to us. But again, go find the destination DNS domain, the destination IP addresses, bring those in as entities on your incidents, and it will unlock a lot of potential, uh, not just with our own uh, playbooks, but indeed with many others. So thank you for letting me go off on a tangent there. Perfect. That was needed. Thank you. Okay. So Yaniv, um, I'll show my screen now and we'll get into, we'll continue this investigation because we're not done yet. Okay. Okay. So in that incident, there was a um, there was a call out to Vagabond Fish. So I'm going to throw this one inside of the chat and I'll make sure that I put it to everyone. So let me bring up chat and everyone. So we'll start from here. Okay. So log into Risk IQ, Illuminate, and start here. So there was um, that domain was listed, and then you can see it underneath here. Okay, so the PayPal uh, um, entity is listed here. So what happened was when we ran that um, playbook, we searched the domain, we pulled the domain out of the log, and we searched it against Risk IQ. It got a hit on this article. Okay, so when we look at this article, it's talking about that there are many different fish kits that are loading similar. Um, components, similar things. So think of it like the credential harvesting component, okay, is listed here. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom, it does a reference to um, Frankenfish, okay? So if I copy this, I'm just going to copy this link address, and I'll put it in the chat so we can follow the path down here. So when I search for this, it brings up this, this new article that Microsoft M365 team came up with that talked about this malicious component uh, that's hosted on dancevita.com. And these two different fish kits were loading the same component. So that's why they called it Frankenfish. It's taking pieces from different things, putting them together and making these kits, these fish kits. Well, um, if we search for that, that um, for dancevita.com. So if I came in here and I search for vita.com, okay, and I'll throw this one in, okay, um, you'll notice that there's an article that gets down here, 
And what the article did was pull in all of the indicators from inside of um, the article and it talked about them. But if you notice, dancevita.com isn't listed in here. It's not part of this article. It wasn't an indicator that was added there. And from Microsoft's perspective, they can only tell when the email comes in, they explode it, they figure out what was coming in and they look at it from analyzing the actual payload and the actual fish kit. So they see that, yeah, this fish kit is doing that. But from Risk IQ, we've already gone out to all the domains in the world and to danzavita.com and we know how they interact already. So if I do a search for danzavita.com, okay, so if I go back twice and I, and I bring this one up now, I'll give you this view, okay? If we look at this, um, the reputation score is suspicious. They don't, it doesn't say much about it, but if we look at what we call host pairs, so when we look at host pairs, and I have, I have a, um, um, I have a slide that I like to show just for a second, that will kind of explain what's happening here. So if you have a bad domain that's linking in and pulling out this component, this Frankenfish, um, a domain name is going out, grabbing this, and, a lot, and when that page is rendered, the 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 main bad page renders, it's actually using that resource on that other site. So this could be loading an image from Microsoft or from Google or Facebook or writing a script for Google Analytics, for example. Um, so this is how that relationship works, okay? So if we take a look at this list here, and I'll expand this out to be 500 or more, when that article was published back in October, 80 domains were noticed, were, were, were talked about. However, there's over 400, okay? And they're all bad. So if you notice, some of these have been has been tagged. Risk IQ has said, oh, this is on the fish list, or we've noticed that there's some, it's, it's, we notice fishing occurring here, and we've put those tags in. But there's some in here that have not been marked yet. And that could be because it's still being set up and weaponized. It's not active yet, or the fish hasn't been sent out. Uh, somebody hasn't become victim first. So in order for um, a lot of these solutions to work is one person needs to be the victim. And then after that, they know that it's bad and then they block it for everybody else. But what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to be proactive about it. So if I look at this particular one and we'll open this one up in another tab and I'll put this one in the link for you so you can see it. And then, um, Uh, we'll we'll look at it. So if we look at the host pairs here, if we notice here, this this David Marketing Directo is loading up stuff from Microsoft. These are two. These three are all Microsoft assets. Uh, Sustainableinfrastructure.org. Um, it's loading up some stuff from there as well, and um, it's loading up Dance Vita. Okay, so you can notice in here that. Um, these are all the pieces that are getting loaded, okay? Now, one, one thing to think about now is, hey, I can come into here and I can go and I can block this inside of um, Defender or I can make an alert inside of um, Azure, but I would have to go through over 400 of them, click on each one, and go to the tab and click on the two things and wait for it to appear, it would take a lot of time. And speed is of the essence now because I already know that somebody came in through a command and control from Cobalt Strike into my organization, and now I want to scale that. I want to be able to go look to make sure that I don't have anybody else that has maybe talked to one of these. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring up a Jupyter Notebook, okay? And this Jupyter Notebook, um, I did this with Mark, okay? And he'll keep me honest and we'll talk about it. So um, the Jupyter Notebooks that we're, we're gonna be showing today uh, also have Mystic in there. So if you're running Jupyter Notebook, we're gonna also give you this config file that you can run through this and it will load up Mystic. 
So then I have the ability to go into Sentinel and grab data out of Sentinel or put data into Sentinel. So we'll make it bi-directional, okay? So, so real quick, my, just to um, yeah. answer some questions uh, that came up in chat, as folks were wondering mm -hmm. why you'd be talking about snakes and notebooks and things. Okay, that wasn't actually what they were asking about, but they were asking like, hey, what's what's this Python, what this Jupyter thing is? Um, let me give you just a really quick kind of from zero high level thing in there. Python is a programming language, my favorite. If you're using Java for anything other than coffee, I'm sorry. Um, it's a joke, but whatever. Um, you should be using Python. Um, I, I love Python as a programming language. It's a great language. It's an interpreted language, which means that it doesn't have to be compiled. It means that you can run the code and see the results directly. Um, that's really where notebooks come in. So a Jupyter notebook, Jupyter is an open source project. A notebook is what you're seeing right now. It's a concept that was introduced by that, um, by that team. It started out, the name actually, Jupiter, um, is really referencing the various languages that it um, originally worked with, which was both Pi and R, and I've forgotten what the other one was in there. If somebody remembers, let me know. Uh, but it began kind of in a data science sort of academic um, context where folks wanted to run a little bit of code and then see the results and the output of that code. And what it has become is a really great context for showing programmatic interactions, um, in our case, in a cybersecurity context, with other data sources, merging in data from other places, but then showing the output of it. And the great thing of it is, is it shows the methodology as well as the output. If you have a, if, if you've written kind of some Python scripts and you've maybe learned about the Python arg parse module, my condolences, uh, but you've got some kind of a script that's running somewhere and uh, you know you you give it to somebody in another team, or worse, you just inherited it, right? You just joined a new team, and they're like, "Hey, here's this script. We don't know what it does, but you should run it when you're doing an investigation." It's like that's too as an analyst, that's too black box for me, right? I don't know what's happening inside there, therefore, I'm not really going to be confident in any of the outcomes that are there. The notebook really helps to solve that, and so what we're seeing here is these collection of cells that are um, have a block of code, and then as we go through this, you're going to see the output of that run directly in there. And so this is a Jupyter notebook. It's running inside of Jupyter. There's also Jupyter Lab. There are notebooks running inside of um, Visual Studio Code, if you've had a chance to try them there. And there's also, of course, notebooks running directly inside of Azure as part of Microsoft Sentinel. And we'll be talking about those later. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of a context is what we're talking about here. And you can kind of see as we're going, oh, sorry, one other thing. When Benjamin was talking about Mystic, um, he was being a little bit mysterious there. We are specifically talking about Mystic Pi. Uh, the joke I always make here at this point is that Mystic Pi was the phrase we would use to describe these round things with dough on top that my grandmother would sometimes serve. Um, we didn't really know what was going on inside of them. They were a little mysterious, not really sure what was happening in there, and it required a bit of courage to actually cut into it and really try giving it a try. Uh, Mystic Pi also takes a little bit of courage, and you do have to be a little bit um, uh, courageous as you start learning about it, but you absolutely should. And that's what we're going to be talking about here. Specifically, Mystic Pi is a Python library that is created by the Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center, Mystic, um, and the engineering teams there to enable interactive investigations directly inside of notebooks. And it is optimized for use with a number of sims. You can query those of you that are running, um, running Splunk um, still. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get you over into Sentinel soon enough. But until then, um, you can actually call Splunk directly from uh, Mystic Pi and of course in Sentinel as well. So we're gonna be leveraging that as we get into the investigation, so. Yeah, and these that notebooks helps. that we're showing can run either inside of Sentinel, inside of the notebook area, or outside, inside of a Jupyter notebook. Yeah, so so if we take a look in here, what I've done is I've I've initialized this notebook to, to start up and bring in the, the, the pieces of Mystic. Um, we're, we're telling them that we're going to be doing a, a pivot. We're going to be doing some uh, DNS and IP address type of analysis. And when we go in and we run the, the um, query time, it brings up a nice little GUI so I can actually go in and say, hey, bring back all this time period of data. Now, when I run this query, the first time it fails when I adjust the time period, and the second time it runs because it's, a, it's a, a little issue that we need to, we need to fix on our side, um, but hasn't happened just yet. But all of those, those results that we saw on the, um, 
the UI are now inside of this notebook, which now gives me the capability of doing some extra actions with them to make our life easier. So I don't have to go through and create an alert for every single one of these separately. I can do it all at once. And I can even take this list and say, hey, I want to go in and I want to verify to see, do I have any hits on this in my environment prior to going into Sentinel and trying to look for this? Um, I'm going to I'm going to connect. So what I'm doing right now is I'm, I'm connecting to um, Sentinel via the notebook and it asks me to authenticate. And let me go back into it. And here it goes. It's now connected, it's connecting here. And now I'm going to run this. I can run it on a single domain, but I wanna run it on everything. So I'm gonna run that one first. So I'm now running this. I'm gonna run the query and this query is gonna look at the entire list of the, the hundreds of, of, of domains that are listed. And then it's gonna come back and give me the results, okay? So it's querying, it's going into Sentinel. And it found out that I did get a hit um, inside of there. So out of that list, um, one of the domains that came back was actually a hit in there. And this is the one that we had picked a moment ago in that list. So that's not good. So now that tells me that the internal user went there, okay? So now the next thing to do is like, I want to push this data into Sentinel so I can do some action with it. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this list and I'm going to connect up to Miss. I'm going to connect up to Sentinel and uh, to our our instance of Sentinel, and I'm going to take some action with it. So now that I'm connected, okay, um, I am now going to push this list uh, into Sentinel. So now this is going to show up as a watch list inside of Sentinel. So now that data is in there. Now that domain that showed up, if I wanted to go and take a look to see, hey, what is that? And it's because it wasn't listed as a fish. So let's look at um, URL scan IO. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna search for that domain real quick. And sure enough, if we take a look at this, I'm gonna throw this in here. Um, this one's telling you that, hey, there's an invoice and I need your credentials in order to put this in. So this is really bad. So I'm going, oh no, this is now another investigation that I need to do based upon that article that was in that first investigation that I've now expanded. So I've created my own threat intelligence. I gathered some data and I'm taking that intelligence back into Sentinel to be able to do some action with that, okay? So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to go back to Yanov and he's now going to take that list and work through it and figure out who that user is and what happened and then what do we need to do to remediate it. And while we're doing that transition there, so to really underscore something Benjamin said, creating our own threat intelligence. I re was really heartened when I saw in the survey questions that more of you are doing investigations than just consuming feeds and that's great you, you should be consuming feeds it's good to make sure that um, we get an alert in our system if users interact with something that uh, is known bad or that some researchers have enumerated that's a good kind of foundational step and that should be there but what we're really finding here is we have surfaced interaction with a domain that was not on any blacklist, so that nobody knew was bad. Nobody knew it was necessarily associated with this. And a combination of that sort of internet perspective, some uh, processes we're going through inside of the notebook, and the analyst perspective that Benjamin is bringing in here has given us greater confidence that really anything associated with that 415 or so is something that should at least be something for us to be concerned about. And we've now gone all the way through to turning that into our own threat intelligence and we're now wiring that directly into our sim so we can get some detections uh, beyond just the one that we found originally. Um, and again, what we did there is we, we had like up to 400 or so domains and we went searching for any of those and we found one of those. And that's pretty cool to be able to do that at scale. Now then the question is, is how we do that and actually become proactive. And that's what Yaniv here has for us.
Thank you, thank you. Uh, ju just one comment here. So you, you saw Benjamin push the data into a watch list in Sentinel, and this is great, and this is like a lookup. I will explain it a bit later. The, most ele the more elegant solution that is coming is the ability to the notebook to push the data directly to the TI, to the Thread Intelligent table, because that will uh, reveal all the built-in uh, detection that we already have that looking on the TI table and map them to existing log streams. But in our case, we push it to the watch list. We can, uh, we can easily use the watch list as, as our source of uh, joins, but something that we are working is the ability to push data directly from notebook into the TI table and then in light all the built-in analytic rules that doing the matching. So, so let me go to the watch list itself. Rem re re remember that, that Benjamin uh, pushed the data directly from the notebook into the watch list. And we have the, this is the, the right, and this is the duplicate that we added, but we will oh, Right on. now the screen hasn't, it hasn't changed yet on our side. Okay, so there it goes. It has now, for there me. Goes. It has for me. The, yeah. the packet sniffers we installed in Benjamin's uh, network or so are running a little bit slow. So you have to give him, you have to have some patience with him while those are those are working. It takes a while to exfil the data out to wherever it is we're sending it. Okay, and, and indeed we see that Benjamin is the one that created this list. Uh, so watch list is, is like a lookup table that, that help us to uh, create structure of data into some list, into some container, and the ability to us to use this data as part of an uh, detection, as part of our hunting query, or as part of our freestyle search. And what I'm doing now, I mimic the same a search that Benjamin did in the notebook, but I will show you the, the KQL phase of the same query. So I'm taking, in my case, I'm cheating a bit because I'm searching directly in the DNS event. This is the DNS table, but I can do it in more scalable and, and, and query multiple tables. But in, in my case, I'm taking the DNS events for the last seven days, where time generated greater than seven days, and I'm doing a join, I'm joining it, and, and this is like uh, one of the specific join that I'm doing, the inner join, with the watch list that we just created, and mapping on a specific uh, field. I know that, that in the DNS event, the host name is in the field name, and the search key is also the, the name uh, as part of the watch list itself. And indeed, if I will run it, uh, we will have a hit, uh, the same hit that, that Benjamin just showed, if uh, KQL will be faster enough to show me, let, let's uh, blame uh, the network in here. Uh, so yeah. indeed, I, indeed, I can see, I can see uh, the same domain that, that uh, Benjamin just showed, uh, and we are seeing like NS lookup, or, or not, not NS lookup, activity, DNS activity from one of the machine against this domain. So now we need to operate. We have two types of operation that we can do. We can directly create a detection rule, and this will help us to use this watch list, this other data in the watch list, to a, a future detection. Every time that a new hit will have in the, in the watch list against any data source, we will have analytic rule that can, that can handle it, and I can create analytic rule directly from, from now, from here. But I need to operate right, now on the security incident that I'm currently have. So I need to take this uh, notable event that I found in my logs and, and, and do with it something. So what I can do, I can add a bookmark. So what I'm doing, I'm marking this row level logs and, and make it like a notable event for me. I, I, I need to give it a name. So let's give it a DNS event uh, from Dan Vita, so let's give it a, a, a name, and, and I will show you what I can do with this bookmark later. Uh, we can do entity mapping. Remember, remember uh, Mark mentioned how, how much important to do the right mapping. So I can look on the logs itself and can do the mapping for the host name itself, and host name here in my log is also in host name. So I'm taking the field from the data that I retrieve, and I'm mapping it to a meaningful bucket. And I can do something else with this host bucket, and, and we will show you. And I can also do a, a tactic a, and, and technique. I, I can map it to a, a, a mitre a tactic. I am not dealing with the lateral moving here. I'm doing with initial access, and I can do a, a technique 
and let's do a phishing. And underneath I have sub techniques and I can do a phishing link. And this will help me in the, in the future. So once I created this bookmark, I can navigate into our hunting section and you will see that I have a new bookmark that I can do a work on, on, on top of it. And what I want to do on this bookmark, I want to promote it to be an incident. And how I can do it, I have a three dots that hidden here. When I press on this bookmark, I can create a new incident from it. So remember in the last demo, we ran a query and every time that we have an, a, a hit, we created a security incident. But in our case here, we are creating an, a manual incident from a bookmark. And I can create, I can give it the same properties that I give, I can assign it. Once I created it, automatically it, appear and, and we can do it with uh, also with API. So no, uh, not only manual steps. So once I created it, I can see it here, it appear and I can do the remediation, the same remediation that we just show. So if I right click and I want to operate, I want to block any activity that happened with this bad domain. So let me again, use our wonderful saw option and run some playbooks. And we will do the same, the same material that we did earlier. Let's do the FortiGate, uh, the FortiNet. So let's block the, the IP uh, on, the, on the, the port itself, on the firewall itself. Let's also block the user that did the, this in integration with the host name. So I can block the uh, user ID. So let's write the user here. So let's block this AAD user. And the last thing that I want to do, I want to block this domain from our endpoint. So let me run the block domain on endpoint and every one of them again is a, is a playbook that you can consume from our uh, gallery. Uh, so let me run. So I did the remediation part. Uh, it's all start with a notable event that appear from a matching that I did against my watch list. Then I did a bookmark. I bookmark this event to be a meaningful event that I can later promote it to an incident. And as a normal security incident, I did my remediation in our, uh, with our playbooks. So this is the flow. Uh, not sure if we have question on yeah, the chat. So, so from that, this point, can you look to see what happened on the machine and any IP address that might have connected to it, if anything right. happened? So I can I can look on the machine itself. Let me let me go to login and I can look on the machine. Let's see. So I have a security event. So let me run the security event. And we have a event ID 4628. It's equal, equal 4628. And let's see. I think that it was a user ID where uh, account contain Benjamin, because I know that Benjamin was, let's do Benjamin and see if we have a hit here. And indeed we see a, a same 46288 process creation event. And what we are seeing here now, Benjamin, is it the same end map or we are seeing different? I don't know, let's see. Oh, let see. so we, we have um, a new, new process oh. name. Mimikatz. Mimikatz, oh. And stealing yes. credentials. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> so, so this is bad. So then we can look at, see who were, where the login was from and what IP address that was from to see, you know, if, if it was, you know, where in the world it was from. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks for the reminder. Benjamin. Yeah. So this is, this is the important things to be able to understand is the full loop aspect of taking, you know, whatever you do in your investigation and you do inside of the SIM, you might need to go check to see if there's anything else. Then when you gather that data, you need to bring it back in to see, was there anything I missed? Because like you saw the threat intelligence, no one knew about that domain, but when now when we do it, we can see that someone ran Mimikatz. You know, if we, if we searched on who the user is, um, you're gonna find out that it's another command and control from Cobalt Strike from a different part of the world. So now you you it's it's serious. So now you know, hey, you had two different attacks that were kind of joined together because it's part of this Frankenfish 
and, and vagabond fish where they're loading up pieces of fish kits to be able to attack. But that's no loading known bad entities. So um, now what we want to do is, um, if you can stop sharing for a second, I will show a screen and then we'll go through and we'll get ready for Mark to do his piece. So let me share real quick. Okay. So I'm bringing up my slides real quick. So this is what happened in this, this particular case is that, hey, we have um, Benjamin got an email clicked. Mimikatz was downloaded a run and it came from an IP that was a command and control. So this is showing that full loop that now I found something else that was bad based upon my own threat intelligence. But now what we wanna do is all of those fish kits load good and bad. And we notice in here that the bad ones loaded this bad dance Vita credential harvesting piece. But if we examined, like when I showed you the host pairs, there were many different host pairs that were there. So there was some images that were being loaded from Microsoft and that so it can look like the Microsoft login. And then it had some Google Tag Manager, there was some uh, fonts that they were using and there's the bad. So if you wanted to, could you potentially go and look at the good things and find bad phishing ransomware that is now loading your good assets from your own organization? And the answer is yes, that we're gonna be able to do that. So if we went and we look at the, um, the aadcdn.net. So Mark, if you when you start, can you bring that up inside of Illuminate to show the host pairs and how many that are there before we start, just so they understand the scope of how big this is and why a notebook is probably the best way to go through and do it? Certainly, be glad okay. to. So I'm gonna stop sharing and Mark will share his screen. All right. So. Let me type this in here real quick because talking and typing at the same time can sometimes not work out as best for me. Let's make sure the site did find the right one and then I'll share my screen with you. All right. And yep, all I of did. the steps, where all the steps and everything are in the slides that we'll share as like a takeaway that you'll be able to have. So one thing I want to just kind of walk through and, and what we're going to do here, we showed you notebooks a little bit earlier. Um, I remember Julia, by the way, that was the other programming language um, that uh, the notebooks originally came from. So Jupyter, Julia, Python, and R. Um, so that was good. Uh, apologies, Ms. Julia, I forgot about you. But yeah, there we go. So that's sorted. Um, the What we're going to do is we're going to go a little bit deeper into the notebook side of this. Uh, Benjamin showed you that kind of quickly showing you the outcome from it. You can imagine that might be the interaction if um, you had inherited the notebooks or if you're an analyst that um, is coming onto a team and somebody's providing that to you. Um, what we're going to do is go a little bit deeper and actually figure out, well, how do I even get started with these notebooks? And specifically, how do I get started with notebooks in the context of Microsoft Sentinel? But before I do, I just want to zoom way back out here for a moment, because one of the things, and this is a, I, I totally get the concern here, but one of the objections that I'll usually hear from folks um, who are maybe just getting started in this is like, hey, you know what, these, these notebooks things, they're mildly spiffy, uh, and they make cool demos, but our team is just not there yet. I'll hear managers say, you know what, we don't have time for people to go deep into that stuff yet. I'll hear uh, individual practitioners saying, yeah, you know what, I'd love to, but it's not, I, I'm having a hard time convincing my colleagues perhaps that this is something that we should be um, digging into. I get it. I totally get it. But think about what we talked about at the beginning of this conversation. We're talking about a fish kit. I don't know if any of you have ever used a fish kit before, but it's basically a uh, open source project typically. Uh, sometimes they try to sell them a little bit or monetize them in some way, but it's essentially a block of code that enables inexperienced fishers to advance and attack using the techniques of more sophisticated attackers. So in really what it's doing is it's templatizing the work um, that is proven techniques. It's allowing them to automate it at scale. It's allowing them to take some of those most sophisticated evil capabilities and spread it out globally to really scale that attack, um, even to people that are still maybe early in this and just want to be able to kind of, you know, be opportunistic in their 
in their attacks. I don't know about you, but a lot of this sounds kind of familiar, right? This sounds like what we as the defenders are striving to do. We are also striving to level up the capabilities of people early in their maturity. We're str um, struggling to you know, recruit enough people on the team, and so we know we need to automate, we know we need to be at scale. My point is, is that I just kind of challenge a little bit this notion that, hey, we're not really ready for this level of sophistication. Well, your adversaries are. The folks that we're uh, combating in all of this have already figured out how to scale, how to automate, how to templatize, and really how to create these repeatable runbooks and scenarios, I believe it's time for us on the defensive side to be doing the same. And that's really what I believe that notebooks give us. So let me go ahead and share um, with you um, my screen and we'll go ahead and dive into this a little bit and, and go just a little bit more into detail. So again, that context there that Benjamin uh, introduced us to We've got this uh, legitimate domain, uh, probably Azure Active Directory Content Distribution Network, msauth.net, very typical to use a CDN to host uh, static assets. So the uh, part of the Windows logo on there. Um, incidentally, that uh, when Benjamin and I were kind of going deep into all this, we were trying to figure out that sustainable infrastructure site. Like, what does a phishing kit want? Apparently, they have a cool little spinner on there. It's called right. the Sustainable Spinner, I think is what I call it. Yeah, so they, yes. whoever was building this fish kit uh, wanted a cool little spinner, and so they just used it from there. Anyway, but in this case, um, it's probably like one of the logos or one of the other things that they're using to generate those pages to lend some level of, de of legitimacy. Um, and maybe even throw you know some of uh, the defenders off base a little bit. If you kind of look at it and be like, well, wait, this is loading um, resources from a legitimate site. It's probably okay. Yeah, well, anybody can do that. So it's not necessarily um, an indication at all. But here is the host pairs, and you see there's 311,000 host pairs on this. And what is, what is especially interesting to me is I keep kind of going on here and, and looking at this. Certainly, we see some legitimate domains, um, but we also see some ones that... Uh, well, frankly, seem a little sus. Uh, OneDrive.com hyphen documents dot something sig or slg si gallery dot plus. Oh yeah, dot plus. That's a that's a legitimate place to go and uh, get your OneDrive documents. So you know, I can as a as a defender look at this and cringe. Right, I've been working with internet domain names a lot. I have this sort of um, you know, kind of a, 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 a spidey sense, if you will. Have you ever heard, you ever used that phrase in describing your analytical techniques to your colleagues? I just have a spidey sense about it. Um, so that's certainly what I'm getting from looking at it. But notice, first observed on that, 329. Last observed yesterday. This is new, folks. This is fresh. This is ongoing. If there was a scenario where I could maybe turn this into a feed, especially if my organization was already fighting phishing attacks that were leveraging the same um, scenario, well, I could actually go from uh, surfacing maybe a few hundred to actually surfacing an ongoing list of things. And that's really where um, the notebook might come into play. It's also important when you're dealing with such a large um, set of, of host pairs. So that is the website context. Anything I, I missed there, Benjamin, on that before well, I Can you I go into the there? causes and, and filter by, by image? Certainly. So if we go into cause and we filter by image source, is that correct? Yes, image okay, source. Okay, great. Yeah. So, so, if you look at, so now if you look at this one, this is where someone's going and pull out these images like these fish kits do. You'll start to notice that there's a lot of bad stuff in there and some stuff hasn't been detected um, and, you know, so some might be okay. Some, um, a majority of them, probably 98%, 99% are bad. Um, so all the glitch me stuff are probably bad. But if you notice, they all haven't been blocked yet. It's because some of these might be just being set up. Some of them might not have been, you know, somebody hasn't received a bad email yet, or it didn't come into... Microsoft for them to detect it. So somebody might have not detected it yet. So exactly. this is this is now we want to take this list and we want to do similar types of stuff, but looking at a known good thing that was loaded that's being used for, for bad. So it doesn't mean that Microsoft is bad or hosting bad things. It just means that they're the big fish and everyone's trying to attack the big fish and that's what's happening. Precisely. 
And you notice too, there's a lot of these subdomains going on. There's a lot of these glitch.me subdomains. Um, they're probably just generating from a simple dictionary or so. Um, or they were recently shopping at Ikea where they sell those, lingon, those jars of lingonberries with also those Ikea meatballs that they serve. Anyway, they're really good. Sort of. Kind of weird. Whatever. But you can see that there's like these subdomains going on. And there's actually, this is becoming, I believe, a bit of a problem because there's a lot of services out there that allow you to spin up free um, shopping carts, free websites, free different hosting services on your own subdomain. And any of those are basically loaning the credibility of their root domain to any of those subdomains that are being created. They may not even realize this is what they're doing, but in practice, this is what's happening. Um, and so, you know, I, I get the, the notion of offering uh, free services online, but any of those uh, potentially has uh, some serious issues associated with it. And, and this subdomain, um, we've talked about subdomain takeover, uh, and that certainly is a separate thing. This right here is just using these resources to, to spin it up. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and um, switch into uh, my terminal. And oops, sorry, this is a different project I'm working on. We, we don't want to go there. So let's, uh, let's Thanks, go into Mark. another directory there. I, it, just, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to worry about that. I, I was trying to make it a little faster, sir. Um, so I apologize. I didn't quite get that done before the meeting here. Um, but in any case, so uh, this this folder right here is just a, a folder on my Mac um, and I've created it just as an empty place in there. Um, we're talking about how to start from zero with your with Python and with notebooks. And I am going to kind of give you a quick overview of how this might work, just raw, pure Python in there. But then I'm going to switch over into um, Azure and show them to you in Microsoft Sentinel because there's some really powerful things you can do by using um, Sentinel notebooks uh, directly in uh, in that context in there. But if you're just starting in here, uh, the first thing you do want to do is create a Python virtual environment. Um, there's some uh, opinions about whether or not uh, you should or shouldn't use a virtual environment. Uh, folks, you really should. Um, it can create a, a huge hot mess if you don't. Uh, it's also important that you want to be able to export out whatever it is that you create in here um, to one of your colleagues so that if you install some random spiffy little package, you can actually know what that is, find it, and share it with them. So that becomes important. Uh, so if you haven't really taken a look at Python virtual environments before, definitely do that. Um, what it essentially does is create a place for us to, um, wow. See what I mean? Talking, typing, doesn't work. Um, tab completion is my friend. So it creates a place for me to start installing Python packages in an actually isolated area. This is even more important when you're doing things um, with uh, Mystic Pi, which installs a lot of different things in there. Um, so once you've activated your virtual environment, then the first thing you want to do is you want to upgrade pip. Um, this is a uh, pip is the uh, Python uh, package uh, manager. And uh, I've noticed there's some really weird errors and issues you can get that just magically go away if, if you do that. Um, once you've done that, then you want to install the necessary packages. Uh, we've talked about in other um, uh, workshops about installing the passive total Python library. You can certainly do that, uh, but because of our integration inside of Mystic Pi, you're going to get that um, just as a process of, of installing that. So if I'm going to install Mystic Pi. Um, I install that, and then there's this thing called extras, which if you haven't used before uh, in installing Python packages, it's basically a way to define a series of um, additional uh, packages that are going to be installed right along with it. So you basically put those square brackets in there, and these are like little extra modules that you can install when you're installing that package. One pro tip, if you're running this on a, a modern version of Mac um, and you have switched over to using uh, Z shell, then you may get an error if you don't escape those um, square brackets. Uh, you'll want to make sure you go ahead and do that. Um, whoops, it looks like I forgot AZ Sentinel in there. I'll fix that later. But anyway, off and run, um, this goes and it's now installing a bunch of packages. So th what this will do is it'll install it within my own local Python environment um, and uh, within that isolated area and get everything I need to be able to install that package in there. Uh, once that's complete, then I can install the um, Jupyter package as well, if I'd like, and that will give me that same environment that you saw on uh, Benjamin's screen there, 
which is essentially a, a browser-based interface um, that is talking into the back end to a group of, I uh, mean, to a, a series of Python kernels or just running applications in Python that are ready to go ahead and receive the commands you send, return those back into the UI. So I wanted to show you this because it, it is possible to do this um, in a sort of from zero scenario if you're installing it on Windows, a little, bit, a little bit different there to get your Python environment and things up and running, um, but that's certainly an option. And I mentioned that you could also run Visual Studio Code um, and there are notebooks included uh, within that context. You should absolutely take a look at that. Uh, there's some really cool variable explorers and some other things you might not get um, by default in there. But as I mentioned, uh, <clears throat> the really fun spot is to actually do this in uh, the context of, of, <clears throat> of Azure Sentinel. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look and see um, how that might um, affect in here. Now I've got a couple different um, logins here. Um, I have another login that will give me um, that I don't yet have uh, a Sentinel uh, workspace configured in. So this is always uh, <clears throat> a little bit interesting to see uh, in live demos how far I can get in the making this work um, in a, a from zero status because it's been a little while since I've started one from zero. Uh, but we're going to get as far as we can in this login and then I'm going to switch over to the other um, browser, the other um, Sentinel context that has those notebooks um, already up and running, uh, so we don't hey, waste hey, Mark, time. Mark, before you there. begin, yes. Hey, Josh, do you want to make the announcement for the winner? You know, I actually don't have it. Mike has it. I think Mike might have who the. It might be. It's inside of your. You should have it in Teams. Oh, please. Yeah, here we go. It is. George E. E is the last initial. George E. Um, try not to share people's full names. But George, you know who you are. Uh, if you want to identify yourself, feel free to on the group chat. Otherwise, we will be in touch with you after the event uh, because you are the lucky recipient of the MX gift card. Outstanding. George is about to go buy a whole lot of coffee, I hope, anyway, or tea or whatever it is that, uh, that, that, you, that is your poison of choice there, George. Um, so congrats on that, by the way. And, and again, thank you all for joining us in this. It's, uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to be able to share with all of you. Thank you for engaging also in the chat. Uh, it's been great to see the, the feedback there. All right. So one thing you do need to keep in mind um, when you're interacting with Sentinel is that there are things called workbooks. Yaniv showed you playbooks earlier, and I'm going to be talking about notebooks. Um, I recommend like mounting some cue cards up in your office to kind of figure out what the difference is between these. Um, it it's, can be easy to confuse them. Um, our, our apologies for that. There's some folks thinking about some ways to, to uh, kind of untangle that. We are speaking specifically here of notebooks. I'm in Sentinel, I go into notebooks. Um, there is actually a lot of templates in here, which is one of the main reasons for um, digging into this because it is going to give you um, a lot more um, context there and a kind of a starting point. But if you want, you can actually create a new um, Azure machine learning workspace. So ML there is, um, th this is actually built on a concept of Azure Machine Learning, and there's a, a really cool benefit of having that um, correlation into there. I do recommend creating um, a new uh, resource group um, for this specifically because it'll make it a little bit easier to do cleanup later on. Uh, create that, um, and then from there, you can define the rest of these fields. And it seems like a little bit arduous to kind of run through all these things, um, but in actuality, it goes pretty quickly. Um, and it fills in some defaults for you and says, hey, I'm just gonna create the storage vault, uh, I mean, the, the storage account key vault application insights. I'm gonna handle all of that for you um, so you don't necessarily have to worry about it. Um, and then uh, let's see, let's go ahead and create a, a new container registry. Actually, I think I can skip this one. Let's see if it'll let me skip that one and see. Um, sure, whatever and sure, whatever, and yes, go for it. And uh, sure, review and create, and let's see if it's actually gonna uh, pass final validation there. It might complain about the container registry. It didn't, wonderful. So now then it's actually creating a workspace and it's actually spinning up all those other different resources there for me. And this is what the deployment is walking me through. 
So when this gets done, it's going to create that workspace. The uh, workspace does um, have a, a little bit of a shared storage concept in there. So when I go into my um, other environment, you'll see um, some reference for the notebooks that uh, Yaniv is working in there. The resources that actually run your notebooks um, are specific to your logged in account. There's not yet a mechanism to share the compute that's running behind there, but there are some folks having some discussions and some thought about that. Um, the, but in any case, once this uh, runs through, you'll end up with a, as I said, an Azure Machine Learning um, uh, workspace that you can then go into. And one of the benefits of doing this is you, if you noticed, uh, Benjamin's very good about just sort of clicking past things as they come up in, inside of demos. Uh, but there was a point that we had to authenticate a couple of times as he was going through the notebook, authenticating into Sentinel so that way he can write his stuff back into there. Um, we One of the benefits of running notebooks directly in that context is that uh, that authentication, you actually authenticate your compute and then your credentials are just brought forward um, into any of those subsequent interactions. So that's how you would start from zero in there. There's some additional documentation on how you might um, get started. But the end result is you're going to end up inside of here, inside of the Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio. Um, and again, you'd click on that notebooks link in there. You'd navigate in. This is where you would end up at. And uh, these notebooks in here, again, this is kind of the list of, of other notebooks that I have um, that I've been working on. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and collapse that to the side. Uh, this was the uh, basic notebook that uh, Benjamin was running earlier, except in this case, um, what we're actually going to do is we'll let that run all the way through, set our time, but we're actually going to use a different host name in here. And this is one of the first benefits, really, of highlighting the, uh, that I want to highlight here, of using notebooks, is that in the past, if you wanted to create a script that was reusable in some way for other folks to be able to interact with, then again, you had to use like some arguments in there, or maybe you had some comments up at the top. Uh, these are things, creating reusable code, it turns out is actually really hard. It's something that professional software engineers spend a lot of time thinking about. There are trade-offs in there. Sometimes making code reusable actually makes it more complicated and that isn't always justified. So it's kind of a hard problem. And if, if you are a, a threat analyst um, or you are just doing some investigations, uh, you might not have all of that experience of a uh, of a software engineer. And because of the context of notebooks, you don't necessarily need it. Uh, if you have some of that to bring into here, that's great. But it's pretty obvious without my having to set up any kind of a parameter or anything. Hey, I don't, I don't know what's happening inside of this crazy little pipeline here, but I see the host name in here. That's probably what I need to do to modify. And of course, when I run it, I get um, that result that we saw um, on the website but I get a lot more. There's actually a lot of columns in here. I didn't go to the trouble of like renaming and, and cleaning these up. I could have, but there's a lot of stuff happening in here. You see, I've got some risk score happening. Um, I've got uh, some counts of the other things you might recognize from the tabs. It'd be kind of interesting to find out where all this came from, right? Uh, looking a little further over, we have um, the, uh, uh, the ghost of Paul Vixie uh, running in here, the, the father of DNS. We've got RR set, R, R, RD type, RD class. What in the world is all of that going on? Um, and then as we get further over, wow, we actually have some latitude and longitude here. Um, that might serve the basis of a nice cool little pew pew map at some point. Uh, and indeed we will have that, of course, because this is a, a, a cybersecurity demo. So we gotta have that in here somewhere. Um, but the question is, where did all this data come from, right? How did it get in here? Well, a lot of the mechanism for this was provided to me by that um, Mystic Pi architecture. And if we look here, we can actually see what it is that's bringing all of this in. What you're seeing is what the authors of Mystic Pi call a pivot pipeline. When we talk about pivoting inside of our investigations, we are referring to the scenario where you start with one thing and then you, you pivot from there to find another result set. And then from each one of those result sets, you pivot off into another direction and you are, uh, you're kind of going deeper, but you're also changing directions. Oftentimes in advancing these investigations, you really do need to pursue a number of pathways, sometimes in parallel, to identify which one is going to give you the best outcomes. And that's what pivoting does. And pivoting inside of a notebook allows us to not only do that at scale, but also to really inherently document what it is that we're doing. I've left this on the screen while I've been blathering on here so that you can kind of walk through this. And even if you're maybe not totally familiar with Python or, or certainly maybe haven't spent a lot of time getting to know Mystic Pi, 
you can kind of see a little bit about what's happening here. And I'm just gonna walk you through this pipeline. Uh, first of all, this parentheses thing um, is something you may not have, have seen before. If you read PEP8, which is the uh, Python um, style guide, apparently somebody actually created a song about PEP8, which is really unsettling. But anyway, um, if you read the Python style guide, then it'll actually say, hey, just tr it, try to avoid scenarios where you have code going onto multiple lines. And that's a good practice. But in this case, having code on multiple lines is actually somewhat uh, handy. Um, and to do that, we wrap it in parentheses. So if you haven't seen that um, syntax before in Python, that's what's happening. This is all just running one big thing on top of the returns of the next. Every one of these lines of code return a pandas data frame. Now, a pandas data frame, if you haven't met pandas before, uh, pandas is another Python library that is optimized for data uh, investigation um, and data analysis. It's a great package. It's got its own set of learning curve, I'll be honest. Um, got a little bit of stuff to have to figure out. I'm still figuring it out myself. Um, and also, as somebody who's written a lot of Python code, I encounter these moments where I'm like, I could just do this with a bunch of Python code and be done with it. Why do I have to deal with these silly pandas? Um, there is some benefit of that, and you'll see that directly in this notebook here. So what we've got in this very first line, uh, Benjamin talked about uh, setting up that pivot environment. We're running the RISC-IQ pivot function, the host pair parents on an individual host name. Now, if you inherit one of these pipelines, um, as you certainly will when we share some of these notebooks out, and you're just trying to wonder what in the wide world of wonder is happening, uh, run through and put a little, uh, whoops, a little hashtag uh, in front of each one of those that will comment out that line of code, um, then run that query again, and what you will get, it run that block of code again, and what you'll get is just the results of that first output. So you see, this is very similar to what Benjamin showed you before. This is really where I started this whole effort. And then from there, you can begin refining down your uh, pivot table using one of two different tools. Uh, you can either use pandas functions to act directly on that data frame, or you can use some of the functions provided by Mystic Pi that are built on there as an extension of the data frames themselves. So one of the pandas um, functions is the query function. And this is kind of SQL-like in its syntax. Um, I at one point started trying to kind of learn what all of those syntax were. I gave up on that and just started um, pretending like it was SQL and most of the time it works. So I'm just happy with that. Um, but you see I've now kind of narrowed down to just CSS import or image.src. Um, and again, there are uh, some great uh, uh, documentation on pandas sites of how each one of these functions work. I encourage you to kind of walk through the, the docs on these. The docs are pretty well written um, and kind of explain what each one is happening. There's another handy pandas function for drop duplicates. Um, so it'll be kind of a little hard to see the results of that uh, in that table. But essentially what I'm doing is just dropping out any rows that have a, a duplicate parent um, in here, really just getting a unique list of host names. Um, there again is a great reason for using pandas. That's a very much a, an inherent and, and common thing you would want to do. Um, I said I wasn't cleaning up too many of the columns. Some of them I am. I'm renaming uh, the parent column to host name, so it's a little more apparent what's happening. And then from there, I'm running this next query. Now this next one, is uh, provided by Mystic Pi. It is a pivot function, and I'm going to run a pivot function. And the function I'm going to run is riskiq.reputation. And I'm going to tell it to act on that hostname column. And if you've ever done anything with SQL and SQL joins, um, essentially what I'm doing is joining things together. If you've ever done VLOOKUPs in Excel, um, that's also similar to what's happening here. And I'm joining that data um, from the results of the reputation with that previous data frame. So you see why it became important for me to know what that previous data frame looked like before I built that. One of the things as you get into uh, running these pi um, pipelines, and I, I really want to um, emphasize this, is you want to use these left on and right on parameters. They are documented inside of Mystic Pi. They're just maybe a little bit hard to find. They're really important because Mystic Pi by default will make a join if your columns are named the same. And in practice, they almost never will be, especially if we are doing what we're doing here, which is we're pulling data from multiple sources and looking to combine them all together into one. So we're pulling in the reputation, we're pulling in uh, the summary, and then I'm using this DNS resolve. And this DNS resolve is provided also by the Mystic Pi package. 
um, very common scenario that you simply want to take a bunch of host names and turn them into IP addresses. Uh, maybe because you're doing a threat hunting workshop and you want to show a cool map with pins on it that show geolocation, or maybe because you're actually doing something a little more practical, like trying to understand the distance between maybe some logins or other things that are happening and all you have is the host names. So that's really where the resolve come in. And as you, if I kind of scroll over here, you'll start to see um, that I'm starting to get some of those other columns stacked in as a result of that data set. Now, if you look in the RR set result, you will find that sometimes there's multiple IP addresses that are coming back. Uh, yes, domains can resolve to multiple IPs. There's a few different ways to solve that. Um, one of the ways is to use a uh, pandas function called explode, which is a great way to basically turn a list of things into separate rows. So if you find yourself dealing with um, an array uh, inside of a, a cell, definitely um, look at the explode function and um, see how that can help you. That is possibly going to create some duplicate rows in here. Um, this is a little bit of a contrived example, and so I'm just going to drop those duplicates out of here entirely. Um, I understand that it might be used that in the process of doing so, I'm carving away some data that, that might be necessary. Um, but again, we're just trying to uh, get a cool pew pew map going on here. Um, after having uh, run that in there, drop those out. You can also drop any of the columns that have essentially a null value. Um, again, because you're trying to create a, a cool demo and you don't want to be tripped up on, uh, on any sort of errors or exceptions that might run. And then the final one that I'm running is the IP address geolocation. This comes as part of Mystic Pi. Uh, it uses a local uh, MaxMind GeoIP database. So it's not even having to make any API calls. It's actually really fast. And that's what gives me the um, columns that have the IP data in here. Now, in just a couple minutes here that I have left, um, I, I'm just going to show you a few things that you can do when you get back this. Um, one of those things is you could group by the classification. As an analyst, a lot of times when you're scrolling down through a list of things, maybe if you're sorting by them, part of the reason why you're doing that is because you're trying to group things that are similar, or you're trying to get a sense of concentration of, um, in this case, maybe how many of these domains are, are known to be sketchy already or suspected as that. Um, and those are the kind of analytics where you need to go ahead and take a little bit of effort uh, in a notebook, put that in there and create some sort of an aggregation so that way other analysts can apply that same thing. Uh, there's also built-in histograms, which can be handy for things like risk scores. Uh, this is already a little bit interesting, but if I want, I can um, query, first of all, to only those that have a score greater than zero, and just look at the distribution across those that are being scored. Um, so that's helpful. And then, of course, as promised, um, we have the ability to do a, a map. And so I can call up a, a map in here with an absolute ginormous Greenland because Mercator projection or not Mercator projection anyway. Um, and now you see that we actually have a very diverse set of IPs in here. And really what we're seeing is the uh, collection of IPs that are all related to those host pairs, right? And that's, that's a little bit unusual to see such a wide distribution of them. All of these steps, the, the map, the histogram, the grouping in there by reputation score, these are all giving me greater confidence that this is probably worthy of, a, of an analytic and sentinel. It is worth creating a, an ongoing process, perhaps, that would allow us to keep pushing this in um, in the future and really validates the effort that I've put in and gives me greater confidence that, um, yes, if I go to the part of actually operationalizing this, um, and, and we're starting to block people from interacting with these things, um, that's probably going to be a pretty high fidelity um, scenario there. So that's what I wanted to share with you here. Uh, Benjamin, we've got just a couple minutes left. Uh, anything I have that one I more use case here? I want to go through real quick. So oh, this one wonderful. now you can, you can push to a, um, you can push this to a watch list just like we did. So now I'm going to show you why you need multi-factor authentication. Okay. So, um, I, uh, last Thursday, I'm driving my son to school and uh, something happened. So what occurred was I got a little pop-up and it says, hey, do you approve this sign-in? And I'm like, and it's to my personal email account. And I say, deny. So when I get home, um, I looked up the logs through, through Authenticator, Microsoft Authenticator, and I saw all these IP addresses and they were all geolocated and very nice. And I saw 
one successful login asking to change my password from Minneapolis, and then all of these other places in the world. So um, I went through and grabbed all those IP addresses and in the actual chat, um, I have those pasted and all of those links are there now. So if I brought these up, okay, hold on. So if we take a look at these, these IP addresses, this is one of them that was just a um, IPv6. Uh, um, as I went through and started looking at these, I started to try to see if there's anything in common with these. And when I started to look at the components, um, Microtech router, there's another one uh, component, Microtech router, point-to-point -point tunnel, okay. And as I went through on each one of these, I started to see a correlation with these components and they were all Microtech routers. And I went, hey, what is what is that? So like when I went out and searched for Microtech um, routers, there's actually an attack that's happening through TrickBot where they're using the Microtech routers they've been taking over and they can proxy through them to do command and control activity or attacks. And so I was part of this. So I'm actually, you know, they were using these routers to attack my personal account. But the only way that I could prevent this was from that authenticator piece because they tried for probably two and a half, three weeks to get in. Um, but uh, by me, you know, having that, that last line of defense, which was you have to say, yes, you can go and make a change to your password or make those changes, uh, it prevented it. it. It saved my account uh, from having any malicious activity. So um, this is really important that you have that type of mechanism. If you have endpoint protection, this is another little piece that is another thing to help you to prevent that from occurring. I was in the car and I go, I got a message, you go, authenticator? Why do I get authenticator? I'm not even at home. I go, oh, oh, deny, deny, and then race back to be able to take a look um, but these are the type of things that you need to be aware of that this is occurring and you need to be um, safe and be able to uh, understand what you can do. Now, to sign up for a community account or a, an account that you can use at your organization, if you use your organization, organization email, you'll get um, more visibility of the data. You can sign up at community.riskiq.com slash learn dash more slash illuminate. Um, please go out and sign up. Um, please give us feedback um, from the last time that we did it. You wanted to see more of this real world interaction between taking something from the inside, going out, doing some investigation, bringing that data back, or starting with threat intelligence and bringing it back into your internal environment. So that was the purpose of today's workshop. Um, I want to thank everybody and um, congratulate our winner. Um, and also, Thank Benjamin, you. I know that I've told you before that I use Microtech routers at the, for the network that I run here at my condo building. That's totally a coincidence. I just want to put that out there for the record. It's just a coincidence. So okay, just perfect. Are, are we are we okay there? We good? We're okay. And okay. Yanni, thank right. you. Thank you so much for, for joining uh, and helping us um, show that interaction between uh, um, Risk IQ's data and uh, Sentinel. I really enjoy it. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Josh, any parting words? Thanks for being here, everyone. Again, trying to keep things practical. Go out there and get the job done now. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. We'll do the uh, lather, rinse, repeat on another area of detection and enforcement. So stay tuned. Thank Thanks you, everyone. everyone.